as we say, uh, last but not least, is uh, Professor Frank Salter, a visiting scholar from the University of Sydney in Australia. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It came as a, a super, absolute surprise. I assumed it was spam, was about to delete, but it, it turned out to be true. Also, I want to thank um, Azerbaijan and the Russian Federation for fantastic hospitality. I will never forget the food and the architecture and the friendliness of the people. That will stay with me forever. Now, my perspective, I'm a political scientist, but I take an anthropological or an, an evolutionary perspective of humans, which means that I see them as basically the same. Wherever you go, you find a human being, you find the same instincts uh, characterized by the same universals of human nature, but also interests. And that's a word I haven't heard used yet in this meeting. Individual interests, group interests, what could they be? I mean, this is a huge topic, and I don't believe one can really discuss multiculturalism without that, without getting into that. I'll be touching on that in indirectly. Now, my focus today will be on Western multiculturalism, with which I'm most familiar, but there's also an Eastern type, and uh, I'm not an expert in that, certainly, but I, as I understand it, multiculturalism is practiced in Singapore and Malaysia, for example, uh, is a different kettle of fish, as we say in, in Australia. It's a different matter. One key difference is that, is that Western multiculturalism excludes majorities from the protection of the state. One definition of multiculturalism is group rights protected by the state. So the state steps in and says, look, we're going to protect certain groups, and one would imagine they would say all ethnic groups, but it's, it's not true with multiculturalism. One authority on American multiculturalism, Eric Kaufman, um, observes that it is asymmetrical. So he defines American and Western multiculturalism as asymmetrical. This creed represses majority group ethnic expression, and that's a, a, a strong characteristic of Western multiculturalism, that the majority, the core ethnic group of those countries, is not considered, uh, doesn't, is not considered to, to be a, a protected uh, group. Now, the effect is to leave the ethnic majority vulnerable to subordination. Indeed, Western multiculturalism has as its basis the unilateral demobilization of majorities and the simultaneous mobilization of minority consciousness. It's asymmetrical. It does different things for minorities and majorities. Now, evidence for this is the undemocratic nature of Western multiculturalism. I know that's a strong word, but I mean it precisely. Undemocratic nature of Western multicultural practice. In my own country, Australia, for example, multiculturalism was introduced by political elites without ever asking the people's permission in elections or a referendum. It was, it was brought in as an administrative act, series of acts. There was a conscious strategy to circumvent democratic choice. And this is quite common throughout the Western world. Now, this undemocratic character is understandable, actually, because Western multiculturalism facilitates, facilitates mass immigration that is displacing many Western populations. It's happening very rapidly. The, the wholesale displacement of Western populations from majority to minority status. Now, as I understand it, that is not a weakness of, East, of Eastern multiculturalism. So we have a, a clear difference there. There are also multiple humanitarian costs, and that will be the, the core of my paper today. Multiple humanitarian costs of Western uh, multiculturalism due to its effect of perpetuating and increasing diversity. And that's a key step in my argument. We've heard a lot about the joys of diversity and I'll be giving something of a cautionary note to balance that. One of the characteristics of multiculturalism is that it perpetuates diversity, that's its raison d'etre, and it, if possible, it increases diversity. And so we, multiculturalism owns diversity. Let, let's, let's consider, I think I have six costs, humanitarian costs, of 
diversity and therefore of multiculturalism. The first is trust. Ethnic diversity systematically decreases solidarity and trust. The best known study of this is by Harvard professor Robert D. Putnam. His study of 30,000, this is a massive study, less than 10 years ago, of 30,000 Americans from 40 different communities and social settings found that rising diversity lowers general social trust, not only of other ethnic groups, but of one's own. For example, of political leaders and the local shopkeeper. Putnam found that as diversity increases, for example, due to immigration, altruism and community cooperation decline. Research in Australia has confirmed this. Um, the second humanitarian cost is welfare rights. In global comparison, welfare rights correlate negatively with ethno-religious diversity. The latter explains 24 to 32% of global variation in welfare rights. That's a substantial, substantial cost of, uh, of multicultural, Western multiculturalism. The third, multicult the third humanitarian cost um, is giving to charitable causes. Now, you know, this, this, this round table concerns hum uh, multiculturalism in everyday life. Giving to charitable causes is depressed by diversity. Um, diversity can also degrade good governance. One cross-national study found that ethnic diversity correlates negatively with institutional efficiency, political stability, bureaucratic efficiency, but it correlates positively with something. Thank heavens we have a relief. It po correlates positively with corruption. A fifth humanitarian cost of Western multiculturalism is foreign aid. Diversity kills foreign aid. Listen to this statistic. One measure of ethnic diversity accounts for 80% of the variation in foreign aid giving, 80%. In other words, there's an 80% correlation, negative correlation between diversity and foreign aid. Civil conflict, this is the most important of all that I'm, I'm, I'm coming to now. This is the, the most important humanitarian cost. There are multiple studies of this, by the way. No, nothing I've stated is based on one study. Multiple studies, all, all triangulating into the same similar results. A recent study of 176 contemporary societies finds that 66% of global variation in ethnic conflict is explained by heterogeneity. Diverse societies are vulnerable to external shocks, such as war, recession, and they're prone to spiral into civil conflict. That's based on studies that go back from the post-World War II era to today. So it's a long, longitudinal studies, multiple studies with the similar results. So my conclusion is that Western multiculturalism is a high-risk policy with numerous humanitarian costs. Let me just end on a note, positive note of solutions. What could be done? And, and my approach is what can be done that will preserve the, the benefits of multiculturalism, because I haven't had time to discuss that. Of course there are, there are benefits. Um, they, they should be preserved if possible. And the approach I want to recommend is to emulate Eastern multiculturalism by affording all ethnic majorities, all ethnic groups, equal protection from the state. This would fit the Western tradition of extending the franchise, in this case, ethnic group rights. It would be a form of democratization. The principle should be that all ethnic groups, or none, should be protected against ethnic defamation. All should benefit from government subsidized ethnic councils and other benefits. Government should no longer ally itself against the majority as a common enemy of other ethnic groups. That's the, that's the trend in, in, in the West. Ethnic swamping of majorities would probably slow or cease if the majority were given a voice. Thanks very much for your attention.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Salter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes uh, the work of our workshop. We respectfully submit uh, our testimony and submissions. Uh, we thank you and the organizers uh, of this forum. Uh, we thank the government, the President and First Lady of uh, Azerbaijan and the Foreign Ministry and the people of Azerbaijan uh, who have been so hospitable to us all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to ask you 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 to ask you